Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I have a special guest. His name is Ernesto Contreras, and he is the head of business development at Dash, a leading cryptocurrency. Ernesto, how's it going, man? It's going great. Thank you for the invitation, Vance. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to you about all things Latin America, this time crypto and Dash. So I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. This is a direction uh, that we're really already pursuing pretty actively, talking about crypto adoption in Latin America. I've had a couple guests on to talk about Bitcoin Cash, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about Dash today, uh, learn about the adoption that we're seeing in Dash, and just kind of learning about Dash in general, because I'm not, I, I actually am a, a software developer in my uh, day-to-day job, but I'm not a super expert on Dash. So we're going to learn a little bit about the cryptocurrency. Um, but first, I wanted to get a bit of background on yourself, how you got into the space, and just sort of give everyone a little bit of context on who you are. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a Venezuelan engineer. Um, I currently live in, in Mexico, uh, south of Cancun. Um, I have 17 years of work experience in in consumer and technology. Um, My first seven years of work I did in Venezuela for consumer brands such as Kraft, some ice cream. And then in 2010, I got a scholarship and I took my bags and I moved to China. I lived in Shanghai from 2010, 2011 till 2013. And then after finishing there, I came to Mexico uh, because I started working in technology. I worked for a, a small startup for in the telecom space for about two or three years. And then in 2017, I was offered to be the marketing manager for the largest exchange in Mexico at the time, which is now the, the largest unicorn in the region. So in, since 2017, I started working full-time in crypto. In 2018, I had the chance to start working in Dash as the business development manager for Latin America. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's crazy to think it's been already four years. I am right now the head of business development globally for Dash Core Group. And basically what we do is we find organizations and partners that want to use Dash as a way of either enabling faster and better transactions of crypto or developing a new solution. So that means exchanges, that also means a telephone company that we implemented so the new phones have a little bit of Dash in it, and it means a lot and a lot and a lot of adoption. We've we've gone from uh, the first chain of of fast food, to my knowledge, in the world, except in Dash globally, that was in Venezuela in 2018, to recently... Uh, about 160,000 locations in the U.S. that accept Dash through a partner. But, you know, it's, it's, it's been really, really amazing to see how we've built a lot of usability for Dash. And, and you know, we're basically at the peak of much usability. And, and that's, that's just amazing. Yeah, when, when I heard that there was 160,000 locations in the U.S., uh, that accept Dash, I found that really surprising. Another 4,000 in Venezuela. And trust me, we're definitely going to talk a bit about usability and adoption in this conversation. But I also just wanted to get a bit more of your background just to kind of understand uh, who you are and everything a little bit better. Um, so it sounds like you were living in Venezuela up to around 2010. And I think, I guess, directly from Venezuela, you went to do your MBA and you went to Holt Business School, and which I know they have like six, seven campuses. Which one or which ones did you study at? Yeah, what I, I mean, at the moment I was exploring where to get a master's or something, and I wanted to push my international experience further. So mm-hmm. uh, at that time, I was working in a bathroom appliances company, and we were getting decimated by the Chinese products. So everyone was saying a lot of speculation about how China manufactures and how they can get those costs. And Holt is a a school that has their main campus in Boston, and then they have satellite campuses in Dubai, London, San Francisco, and Shanghai. 
So when I knew that I could do my MBA in an American school in English in China, that was a no-brainer for me. So I went to Shanghai. I was supposed to rotate and do San Francisco, but I just fell in love with the Shang. And I stayed in Shanghai for uh, almost two years. Um, you know, it, it was surreal to learn so much about China, their history, their culture, and I just couldn't have enough. So I, I ended up staying way over my MBA. I, I took some Chinese classes to, to learn a little bit of, of Chinese, which is now Mama Hu Hu, which is, you know, bad. But yeah, that, that, was, that was amazing. And then after finishing that, I loved living abroad. You, you, I think that probably it's what's happening to you and, and you, you just immerse yourself in new things. You push your boundaries. You're forced to learn new, new, new habits, new ways mm -hmm. of seeing things. And that was exactly what was offered to me after my MBA. So I came to Mexico and I said I was going to be here for a couple of years, but you know what? Blink of an eye and it's almost nine years since. I came eight years. I came here in 2013. So um, besides that, you know, uh, I love reading, riding my bicycle, and I love going to the beach as much as possible, which is the reason why now I moved out of Mexico City and I'm more to the south. Yeah, and where, um, so you said south of Cancun, so are you in Playa del Carmen or Puerto Morelos yeah. or where? Yeah, I'm close to Playa del Carmen. Yep, very close to Playa del Carmen. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I uh, I was just in Playa um, up until February of this year, so I know Playa super well. Yeah, oh, great. So well, maybe we could have met if we had known. But yeah, it's uh, I mean it's totally different from Mexico City. Uh, that that has its positives and it's not so positives in Mexico City and Guadalajara as well. Um, you have all these services. Everything is much faster, but here. You're a bit more far from the uh, regular, um, uh, faster living of cities. And uh, it's, I love the clean air, but, you know, things are a bit slower and there's no Uber, for example. So it's, it's more difficult to move around. Although in downtown Playa del Carmen, there's lots of bikes and stuff to move around. But I'm not there because I didn't want to live in a place that's party 24-7. So I'm like more in the in the outskirts, so that I can enjoy more of the nature and and ride my bicycle. Yeah, for sure. If I had to guess, you're maybe in Real Ibiza, <laughs> but um, I won't. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Playa del Carmen, um, definitely clean air, um, slower pace of living, but I think you really do have all the services. I mean, there's two WalMarts. Yeah. Um, and they kind of everything. So it's a really good balance. Um, yeah. You know what I was thinking, though, is that moving from Venezuela to China must have been an insane change. How was yeah. that? Yeah. Um, at the moment, Venezuela was not the destroyed economy that it is now. So I was living in, in pretty much what you would find in most Latin American cities, you know, inequality, but, you know, services were good at the moment venezuela was for example one of the countries with the highest penetration of smartphones so the biggest change was uh, to see how china was such a futuristic place and and i wasn't expecting that it would be so forward looking um i remember in shanghai just seeing all the huge amount of skyscrapers and all the international brands that I didn't expect to see there, you know, the mm -hmm. Louis Vuitton, the Bentley dealerships, and of course the McDonald's and Starbucks every corner. So mm -hmm. it was really interesting to see that, number one, um, many of us have the, all of our thoughts wrong about China, about it being uh, very rural and non-capitalistic place. It's full with all the international brands and the big cities are really, really um, futuristic. And, you know, in terms of, of getting to know a bit of the culture, and I say a bit because you can never learn enough of one culture, it, it was mind-blowing that the Chinese people in Venezuela are very different in terms of behaving 
to the Chinese people in, in China. Uh, in Venezuela, I found them to be more um, private and less open and more, I don't know if the word is, is cold, but more serious. You know, and, and in Venezuela, we have a lot of Chinese that own uh, retailers and small stores. So mm -hmm. you would go and buy something and they'll be like, oh, 24, that's it, or 24, because they, they don't pronounce the R. And then they're very cold and they give you your change and that's it. But when I went to China, I was surprised to see, you know, the, the, the warmth of people and, and how open they were and how nice they were to, to the Lao Wais or the foreigners, mm -hmm. how they call them. So that was, that was really interesting. And of course, I, I couldn't explore as much as I would want to because I was full-time studying. So all the exploring was, you know, in the afternoons or in the weekends or whenever we had some uh, holidays. But yeah, it, it was amazing. And then I had the chance to work with a couple of companies that hired me for sourcing projects. And when I went to the industrial areas of Shanghai or in the south, Shenzhen or Guangzhou, it was just, uh, number one, very impressive to see the size of these things. I remember driving in front of uh, the Foxconn uh, site at Shenzhen. And the factories? I, yeah, but Foxconn is where they make all of the Apple material. Mm -hmm. So I was driving in front of the bigger one they have in China, and... Um, you start driving by it and you see the first exit and you drive for about 30 minutes and it's still the same location that, that does Foxconn. Uh, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but I remember driving a lot and driving and driving and driving. And to the right, there was still the factory and the buildings where people stay. So uh, that just shows you a bit of the size and the magnitude of, of the industrial power that the Chinese have. So uh, it, it was it was very very uh, mind boggling and and it just opened my 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 view to many things that I that I had not ex experienced before, especially in the terms of size difference between countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you know even when you were in Venezuela, you you mentioned that you realized that China was becoming very competitive quote unquote, taking over, um, you know, you, you went over there, you started learning Chinese, you got to see it firsthand during really some of the most rapid years of the development of the country, um, you know, 2011 to 2013, probably seeing like 10% plus GDP growth per year. Yeah. Um, and I think you said that even after your MBA ended, uh, you decided to stay on for a little bit. Um, I know, you know, <laughs> maybe I can phrase this correctly, but I know like a lot of like gringos are very starry eyed about Latin America and we love the good weather and it, it's, it's easier for us, but a lot of maybe Latinos are slightly more pessimistic because it is a little bit harder to earn a living when you, my question is sort of when you were in China, were you wanting to go back to Latin America? Um, did you want to continue in China um, or did, did you want to maybe like go to the U S when you got your MBA or how, like what kind of like set of options did you have that led to, you know, your decisions of where to, to base up and what to do next? Yeah. Well, I definitely wanted to stay more in China and there were like two different periods of me staying in Shanghai the first period is when I was studying and you literally live in a bubble because, you know, you're studying, you have your savings, you live in your dorm, you go to school, then you go party, then you study again. <laughs> so that's literally not life in China. And then when I stayed later for doing a couple of projects and, and I started actually looking for jobs, then I moved out of the dorm and I stayed in a in a local uh, apartment and then you see a little bit more of, of the reality of living in a very far off place and you mm -hmm. start not, now i didn't have you know my 90 friends to fall back on or ask for anything you, you were more alone so overall I, I loved it and i stayed as much as i could uh, but one thing i realized is that me having a background in marketing and business development 
without having a very good management of the language. And as I said, you know, at the time, my Chinese was very basic. Right now, it's basic and rusty. So it wasn't good enough for getting a, a growth or marketing position that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what made me, you know, say, okay, maybe I won't stay here any much longer because I'm, I'm not moving forward like I wanted. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I had these conversations with people before going to my MBA that, you know, that the, there were some opportunities in other places. So I rang them up and I said, well, what do you have? And I, I was exploring whether to come back to Venezuela. 2013, the country was still uh, not bad economically, although I always saw that the direction that the economy was being taken was not sustainable. And that's why, you know, I had a couple of, of opportunities to interview in different places. And of all of them, I decided Mexico because of the huge economy and how close it is to the rest of the world and how I personally believe that uh, Mexico is the better invested country in all of Latin America because almost every company in the U.S. that wants to expand, they generally explore Mexico first. And mm -hmm. European and Asian companies that want to go to the Americas, they usually go to Mexico or Brazil. So mm -hmm. that analysis told me, well, in Mexico, there's going to be good opportunities to do stuff, fun stuff, technology, and, and you know, do a, a lot of growth and learning. Mm -hmm. And that mixed with the first opportunity I had here just uh, made me finish packing up and, and come into to Mexico and it's it's been amazing here. I've been uh, I've had the chance of living in Mexico City, Guadalajara, uh, Cancun, where I am now, and uh, uh, like literally three, four places inside of Mexico City. So I've had the chance to live in different places and and uh, the culture here, the the food, the people. That this is so rich and I've had a great great time. Yeah, that's awesome. I uh, I actually I also have a a Venezuelan buddy in, in Playa del Carmen. They run a a multi million dollar online business. So maybe I could introduce you guys at some point. Oh, cool! Yeah, um, we'll have some arepas or tequeños in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of good Venezuelan restaurants in Playa. There's um I think it's called the Venezuelan Corner. Um, there's another one uh near the uh the palacio municipal it's like right across the street i forget what it's called though so it's like yeah. K. yeah it's like across a plaza right yeah it's called like uh, it's like a it's like a venezuelan yeah. word yeah i've been there i've been there <laughs> I, mean, I, I had come here like four or five years ago and i always wanted to come and and stay longer and uh you know i've been working remotely for almost five years so uh, i didn't do it before because i don't know i never consider it so just uh Finally made the plans, looked for it, and changed. And and uh, it's uh, we we've been here for only about two months, so maybe we'll stay a bit. Oh, uh, yeah, that's awesome that you're able to work remote. Um, tell, you know, <laughs> I, I almost want to continue going sort of like con consecutively with your story, but I feel like we should uh, <laughs> maybe talk maybe talk a little bit about Dash. Um, so. Yeah, I guess the simplest question is, what is Dash? Yeah, well, Dash is a cryptocurrency, just like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, or any of these other cryptos that are open source, they're borderless, and they're decentralized. So Dash is short for digital cash, and it's a cryptocurrency that's a fork of Bitcoin, but it's got some technical improvements to make it uh, faster and cheaper to send around. So if I send you a dollar or $10,000 of Dash, you will get them within two seconds. It's usually a second something. And the cost is going to be about a 20th of a penny. So mm -hmm. that enables several use cases, such as small amounts of remittances, micropayments, and so on and so on. In the trading space, Dash is very much utilized for moving money from one exchange to the other. So let's say you have, you know, your trading money on, on Binance and Coinbase, and you see that there's an opportunity to buy Bitcoin cheaper on Coinbase. 
if you would send your Bitcoin, it would take, uh, if you would send uh, money from, from Binance to Coinbase, it would take you maybe an hour to get the money there. But if you converted whatever you had on Binance and sent it to Coinbase, you would have your money available for buying that cheaper Bitcoin in about five minutes. And in other exchanges, that takes three seconds. So this opens up a lot of arbitrage and trading opportunities. And that is the technical side of Dash. On the organization side, Dash was the first DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which means anyone can post proposals to the Dash network. And if they're voted positively, you can receive rewards in Dash. So then you can build projects and solutions to grow the Dash ecosystem. This allows for teams to grow in uh, Thailand. This allows mm -hmm. for a marketing hub that's operating out of the US. This allows for the Dash core group, which is where I work. We have, uh, the, the we're about 45 or 50 people. Almost all of them are developers. And there's about three, there's about four people that are doing business development and marketing, and we mm -hmm. help this grow. So uh, the DAO, allows anyone to take this technology that I described and apply it either to developing more solutions or to growing and, and doing business development to, to allow for more usage. So for me, this is a very unique proposition and it's one of the reasons why I believe that Dash has taken the lead in, in getting a lot of adoption and usage. And of course, we've run a lot of experiments that haven't worked that well. But this is a, a unique um, differentiator, in my opinion, versus other coins that maybe are good for payments, but don't have the way of spreading seeds and figuring out which one grows. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so just to uh, explain to people, a DAO uh, stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which is sort of like an alternative... Uh, organizational structure sort of like a the new crypto alternative to an llc and it, it, is it true that uh that the dash the da the dash dao was the very first dao as far as i'm aware there was no other dao before dash back in dash was uh launched on 2014 and then i believe it took about a year to uh, spin up the dao and I, I don't recall any other large crypto that has uh, been, number one, as long as we have with the working DAO and that has all the experience and all the ups and downs we've had as a DAO. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud and, and happy to say that even though we haven't pushed the narrative of, of being a DAO with a new breed of DAOs, um, what I've seen is that we have a working system right now. Anyone can go to dashcentral.org and submit a proposal. And then there's a network of about 5,000 masternodes and about uh, maybe between 1,000 to 1,500 of them constantly vote on the projects. And then, you know, you have all of these teams that are working and developing very cool stuff for for the dash network one of them is the solution that we're going to talk about that allows for 160,000 places in the us to receive dash but this has for example uh, allowed uh, for in the past we had about 20 teams in venezuela that submitted proposals and then they did um, uh, webinars meetups adoption initiatives we have teams in Brazil that are also doing the same. We've had teams in the U.S. and, and in Europe. So this allows for an automated mechanism for different organizations to say, hey, I want to contribute to Dash. Here it is. Uh, here is how I can be an active participator in Dash. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. And so uh, I, I think when I kind of looked at your LinkedIn, you started off as sort of the Latin American uh, representative for Dash and then actually got promoted to are you the global head of business development or, or how exactly does it work? Yeah, yeah. Initially, um, I, was, I started by 
helping Dash Core Group grow in, in projects and initiatives in, with a Latin American focus. And about two years ago, um, there was the opportunity and, and I started managing the whole team. The whole team is not a big team. It, we're about four people in total. In this moment, we're a man short. But yeah, what we do is we, we take care of all the growth initiatives that DCG can handle. And that goes from talking to exchanges, uh, for example, for us to get into Coinbase, it mm-hmm. took about two years because the process is oh, not wow. as fast as, you know, from the first time you make a, a, an intro and then, you know, the, the exchanges, they have their own velocity. And sometimes, you know, they're saying we're not going to add any more coins and then they start adding coins and it's, it's a relationship building for the bigger projects uh, on the same uh type of large projects but a bit more non-crypto it took us about 20 months to get into the largest point of sale integrator in venezuela this is you know when you go to a supermarket when you're going to pay that system is set up by a point of sale company Mm -hmm. and that point of sale company gives it to a supermarket so from the first reach out I did to this company called Megasoft until they were finally live, it took about, you know, 20 months, almost two years. And those are the bigger projects. Then there are the, uh, I'm going to call them smaller, less complex projects where, you know, there's a startup with a wallet or a smaller exchange and they want to accept Dash. So that's basically what we've been doing. And, and I did it initially only in Latin America. And then after that, we, we did it. I am leading the global team. And that means that we focus more on the Americas region because of uh, uh, we're closer and, and we're not a huge team. But also, you know, we, we keep integrating products and services in Europe and Asia. Um, it's, it's really interesting. It's, uh, many times it means that, you know, you have to take a call at 5 a.m. or at 10 p.m., if you're mm-hmm. going to talk to the other side of the world, but it's it's part of the beauty of, of working in a remote and decentralized organization. No, I get it. I mean, you can have the best technology in the world, but, you know, someone's kind of got to go out there and build the partnerships with the exchanges, with the point of sale, with this and that, because, you know, a lot of stuff does happen organically, but a lot of stuff does sort of need people as drivers. And it makes me, it, it sort of begs the question and apologies, I don't want to be too like pocket watchy, but how do, how are people on the Dash team compensated? Is it sort of on a volunteer basis? Do you get like paid out like a percentage of like coins or something yeah. or like, how, how does it all work? Yeah. The way the Dash DAO works is, remember I said anyone can post proposals and then receive grants from it. Mm-hmm. So Anyone can go to dashcentral.org and submit a proposal. So let's say that you wanted to make a My Latin Life set of, of, of interviews or videos around Latin America, and that would cost you, I'm making numbers of, you know, $5,000 a month. Right, so like a Kickstarter. The, yeah, you could go to the, to the website, submit a proposal, and say, I'm going to do this, and the outcomes are going to be two videos per month. and then. If you get approved, you will get, let's say you wanted $5,000 and right now one dash where at $100. So you would submit a proposal for 50 dash. Mm-hmm. And then you would get those 50 dash every month for the next two months. And you would then cash them out and, and change them into dollars if that's what you wanted. Definitely makes sense. And then, so, I mean, so there's software developers. I'm sure some of them are submitting pull requests just because they find bugs and they're not really compensated. I, I guess it sounds like other developers are maybe uh, putting together proposals for larger feature sets and they want to be compensated for those feature sets. Um, is everyone sort of working on a contract project basis? Is anyone sort of like on a salary that's like paid out by the DAO or? Yeah, ha- yeah, yeah. The way it works is, You have that network that I just described and people get paid in Dash. But then under the the super block, which is the way or or the moment where where salaries are paid or or projects are paid, under the super block, you can build companies 
And then you can hire people that are paid from the super block, but then through the company. That is exactly the case of DCG. So DCG found a way to creating a, a formal structure. So DCG or a Dash Core Group has, for example, bank accounts where they can store the money that they save. And then they can receive, uh, let's say they received 200, uh, 2,000 Dash, and that's $200,000. So they would cash out that money and put it in a bank, and then they would be able to normally hire people like a regular organization. Other uh, organizations or individuals prefer to keep the dash, and then if the dash goes up, then you get you have more money for the runway, and if it goes down, you have less money. But everyone organizes their organization around mm-hmm. the way to better serve the DAO. Something mm-hmm. that we learned uh, in the in the past winter is that if you keep all of your money in Dash and Dash crashes, then you're going to be in a difficult financial situation. So something that I've seen different teams do is that they can build a reserve and then have a reserve of, of, of uh, fiat. So then if the price of Dash goes up or down too much, it will not impact you. So you have more stability. So what, what's been really unique and great to see within the DAO is how the organizations within it have learned how to deal in a crypto world. Um, we, we still get paid most of our things in Dash, but some of the people, and especially in certain uh, geographies, because of regulation, prefer to get paid in fiat because it's easier. So mm-hmm. there, there's a mix of that. So, but overall... The DAO pays to the organization in Dash, denominated in Dash, and then at the exchange rate, that organization can decide to pay their employee or employees in Dash or in dollars, depending how. And then they also then have to do the accounting and all the other legal requirements. But it's it's a very cool and unique experiment. And as far as I know, it's the only one in the world that has been doing it for so long. And, and the DAO in general, of course, has had its ups and downs, but it's really unique and it, it's really cool. I, I really believe in the, in the future, you know, in, in 10, 20 years from now, DAOs are going to be very popular and there's going to be more beyond just crypto. Um, mm-hmm. Because here's That's an right. example that I see that it's going to be a really low hanging fruit. Imagine the... the I always forget how to say this in English, the the administration of a building or a compound. And, you know, everyone in those build in those apartments, they have one vote and they can decide whether you want to build a basketball court or plant more trees. So if everyone votes and then they say, we're going to vote for more trees and we're going to hire contractor A, immediately those funds can get disimbursed to contractor A, who would then go and plant more trees. So that type of automated governance where you're connecting the source of funds and the distribution is something unique and something that I believe will go beyond just the crypto companies. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said for longevity and the DAO model is really, really interesting. Um, when did uh, Dash launch on Coinbase? Like, what year was it? Well, it was probably two years ago. It was about half of my tenure here. And so, what was that process like? I mean, I know that Coinbase has a very high uh, barrier to entry, a strenuous process. Like, do you have any good like anecdotes of you know the <laughs> you know the day to day process there? In yeah. terms of getting that getting that onboarded, yeah, and and I understand a lot of it, or I think I understand a lot of it because I worked in an exchange before. So the the day to day of an exchange is that you have a million things going on. You know, you have to keep your customers happy. You have to provide great service. You have to have mm-hmm. good liquidity, and then you're also playing on the defensive a lot. Because every exchange, I'm sure it's it's getting you know dozens or tens of attacks every month, and and you know there's lots of people just working to see how they can hack exchanges. So 
whenever uh, an exchange gets an attack, they have to stop doing other things and then dedicate to making sure they control and, and stop the attack and then mitigate whatever happens. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand that exchanges are thinking of growing and at the same time making sure they can be secure. And then on top of that, maybe, you know, you get a call from a regulator asking questions on why you're selling Bitcoin if Bitcoin is used for criminals. So, you know, they are constantly having a handful of things going on and the growth projects are not always as fast as, as people want it. So the, the way it goes, you reach out to them and you say, hey, we're working with Dash. We can provide your customers this and those features or this and those benefits. And we have this huge community of whatever. Uh, let's talk. Usually the largest exchanges, they have a listing process. So they ask you to send a bunch of information and then they check it internally. But where it gets tricky is that because of the history and the, and the accusations of, of some exchanges uh, moving the price because they're so good that if, if they say, hey, Dash is going to be listed on Coinbase, the price will explode, then usually all of these exchanges never tell you that they're going to list you. So you're basically talking to people and you're on the dark and you don't know exactly what or when will happen, but you see that something is moving forward. And then mm -hmm. when you start receiving emails back with more specific technical questions, like, well, what is instant send? What is chain logs? Why does this way take two seconds and this other way takes uh, two minutes? Then you're like, okay, they're working on the integration, but you'd never get a confirmation from them. And then, you know, maybe a, a day or two, and that's the case with Coinbase, they put up a blog post and they're saying, hey, we're going to start trading Dash in two days. And you're like, oh, yeah. But in all of this time that you're responding to them and talking, you, well, what we did is we worked with our marketing team and say, hey, it looks like we'll be on Coinbase. Let's prepare an announcement. Let's prepare a bunch of posts. Let's prepare a giveaway so that whenever that happens, we can put more, 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 uh, communication out there and we can get a bigger splash. So that's exactly what happened with Coinbase. We had been talking to them for a long time. Sometimes the emails would take, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months to be returned from their side. And then they started being more uh, faster in communication and asking more specific details. Mm -hmm. And that's when we were saying, okay, we're onto something. And then you see the blog post and two days later, finally that process is completed. It's funny. It definitely sounds like a, a bit of an opaque process, which is a bit ironic in the world of cryptocurrency. Um, what do you think might have been some of the biggest um, obstacles to onboarding onto Coinbase? And what do you think it was that maybe ultimately uh, moved the meter or allowed uh, Dash to get the okay to move forward? Yeah, well, I, I have to say that all of this that I'm saying is speculation because I never got uh, any specifics from Coinbase or any other partner. But mm -hmm. what what I um, what, what I can imagine that happens is they have their own priorities, and maybe they're saying let's list more coins, and then NFTs come along, and they're like, oh, you know what? Don't don't continue working on these bands. Let's go and do NFTs. And then they start doing NFTs. Or maybe they're working and they, they get a call from a regulator that's asking about certain coins and they have to stop adding more coins because they're responding. So they mm -hmm. have their own uh, processes and, 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 and priorities that drive what they move faster than the, than the other. And definitely what makes them, in my opinion, consider listing a coin is that the coin is either becoming very popular, like, you know, recently they launched the Ape coin. And because mm -hmm. it's so popular and everyone's talking about Ape, you have seen that many exchanges just listed the, the board Ape coin, or mm -hmm. it becomes very useful or a mix of those. So what I can imagine is that two years ago, um, they realized that, you know, Dash was one of the only coins 
or maybe the only coin that was working to get a lot of real adoption. And, and, and you know, that goes very well with the ethos of crypto. You know, you want to be able to have peer-to-peer electronic cash, which is the way everything started with the white paper of Satoshi. So um, I'm, I'm, I definitely have strong feelings that, you know, they saw the work that all the Dash DAO was doing and how we're, mm-hmm. we were opening up usage capabilities and use cases in different parts of the world. And they acknowledged that 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 was good for crypto overall, and they wanted to be part of it. Definitely. And you're setting up a good segue, Ernesto, which is to talk about usability and everything. Um, I want to actually leave usability kind of till the end, because I wanted to ask specifically about Bitcoin Cash and sort of other Bitcoin competitors. Um, and so let, let's sort of do that segment first, and then we'll kind of speak to the amazing adoption that we're seeing of Dash and all that. So um, to my understanding, Dash is a fork of Bitcoin. Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin. Um, what's like the main difference between the two? Yeah, um, I have to say that I'm not an expert on Bitcoin Cash, although I've used a little bit of it. Um, I understand that uh, Dash was born with the intent of being very different from Bitcoin insofar that it's supposed to be digital cash. So the code is, uh, in, my, in, my under, in my very bad understanding of, of code, has big differences. One of them is that we are a two-tired network so we, not, we, we, we have not only the miners, but then there's the, the level of the master nodes, which provide other services to the Dash network. So these two levels allow for having more things. Although there are some similar uh, services that I know uh, Bitcoin Cash does, but I think the way that they went through it was differently. In, in my understanding, and I could be wrong, please correct me here, Bitcoin Cash increased the block size and that allows for some things. With the Masternode approach, you have this level of um, connection to the network that allows you for double checking things. For example, when you send a Dash transaction, that transaction gets broadcasted to a small subset of the master nodes, and then they validate if the transaction is real or not, and they return, yeah, this is a real transaction, go ahead and process it, and then they pass that transaction to a line of my, or, or that will be mined later. And this not only allows for faster transactions than, let's say, Bitcoin, but it's allowing a new development that that it's happening now that's called a platform or evolution where you will be able to store some data on the chain. So I think that's a difference technically, but the biggest difference non-technical is the voting part. And yeah, please. please, uh. And yeah, no, I, I I didn't even want you to go down the technical route because, you know, neither of us are super experts on that, but I was actually more interested in sort of the user uh, the user experience perspective of Bitcoin Cash versus Dash. And I guess for a little background, so I think Bit, or da- from what I'm hearing, Dash forked from Bitcoin in 2014. And I think Bitcoin Cash forked in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. but ultimately, like they both provide sort of, you know, peer to peer transactions, very low transaction fees, you know, uh, yeah. you know, in, you know, pennies transaction fee even if you send a million bucks and it's very very fast like a second or two yeah um at the user experience level they both sound good they basically both sound the same on on those sort of two metrics of low fees and speed are there any other points of interest or things that you would note from a user experience perspective uh with dash versus bitcoin cash yeah, I, I think in terms of usability, they are very similar from, from what I've seen. Uh, you know, low cost and fast speed. And the big difference, I would say, is that with Dash, you have a DAO, which is a way that you can approach to get funding for developing things. 
And I'm not sure how the, the development or, or the grants or, you know, if I wanted to work for Bitcoin Cash, how I would approach to try to get some uh, grants from it. Even though, you know, that's debatable because I've, I've had this conversation with uh, friends that are only Bitcoiners. And what they tell me is that, yeah, you know, you don't build stuff with grants. You would just build it with, uh, with, the, with the network. So, you know, those are other types of debates, but just to highlight the difference from a UX perspective, if you have a product that is built on Dash or Bitcoin Cash, I think that the working will be similar right now. And from a, from a, from a ecosystem perspective, the Dash DAO has a way to allocate grants. And I, I don't know how the Bitcoin Cash community would allocate uh, funding and resources. But those mm-hmm. are the differences that I see. And, and as, as I said, again, I'm not an expert in Bitcoin Cash. So I, I would defer to you to tell me a bit more about how the building of stuff happens on, on Bitcoin Cash. Yeah, and I'm not an expert either, but I do obviously like the sound of a DAO. I like the sound of an open governance model um, and the ability for everyone in the community to sort of get together and, and choose what's best. Uh, for the coin and for the community. Um, I know Bitcoin Cash is um, sort of tightly held in terms of the number of, uh, not shareholders, but like coin holders at the top. Um, What do you know about Dash? Like who are the biggest holders of Dash? Is it mostly in the hands of private individuals? Uh, What kind of uh, uh, institutional adoption are you seeing like yeah, who are the biggest like groups uh, pushing Dash forward from a, yeah. their biggest holders? Yeah, um, I saw a website that I'm trying to pull up now that's called Are We Decentralized Yet? And <laughs> it showed something like, yeah, for example, the percentage of money supply held by the top 100 accounts in Dash is 14%. And in Bitcoin is 19%. So the top 100 accounts in Bitcoin hold 19% of the coins. And in Dash, they hold 14% of the coins. And is, is Bitcoin Cash there? Yeah, let me look at it. Bitcoin Cash says 24%. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is just one reference that I saw once. I'm, I'm not sure if Dogecoin is 50%. So according to this metric, and it's not perfect because uh, every time people rebate or debate that that exchanges are some of the biggest holders, but that's just one way of seeing it. In the day-to-day, what I see in in Dash is, well, before this, um, Dash was launched in 2014, and then it stayed trading for less than a dollar for about a year. And then it went up to the one to five dollar range for another maybe year or so, and then it shot up. So the whatever distribution happened initially, and and there was a big uh, fight because there was a an Insta mine bug which was inherited by the part of the Litecoin code that was uh, used. Um, whatever distribution happened in the first couple of months had about a year or something to change again. And that brings us to today where, you know, when I see the voting pattern, there are a lot of single or, or two master node votes. And there's obviously a few uh, voters with, with large number of master nodes. How do I know this? There, there are a couple of websites that show you the proposals and the votes as they happen. So you see like every two minutes, you know, if there's, a two vote for a proposal and that two vote is repeated everywhere you imagine well this is a person with two master nodes and then there's a you know 75 votes on everything and you would imagine that there's somebody with 75 master nodes so i mean just from my own speculation and observation of of the of the network out of the thousand uh more or less thousand constant votes there's maybe like 300 that are in the hands of, of a few people. And then there's maybe like another 500 that are in the hands of, of many people. 
So, I mean, just, just like anything else, there's always some concentration. Some people were very lucky or very visionary to get in early. And you get rewards from masternodes. This is something I forgot to tell you. So we actually kind of invented the staking concept as well. We never called it staking. Oh, well. So uh, if you have a thousand coins, you spin up a masternode, you get this chance to vote, and also you get about 7% of return per year. So yeah, we, we did a bunch of, of innovations back in the day, which is one of the reasons why Dash spiked in the 2018 era. And, you know, we've been working, the, the tech team has been working hard to uh, push the new new round of innovations and, and we have not done it yet. Hopefully we'll do it by the middle of this year. And that'll put us again on the radar of many people. But w- when we start, you know, peeling the onion and talking to people about the innovations and the capabilities we've had for years, that wow that you mentioned is quite common because they're like, oh, we didn't know that you were the first DAO. We didn't know that you can stake coins in there. So yeah, it's a great technology and, and I respect all the other technologies out there. And But, but I really feel that Dash is, is very, very good in terms of what they do and, and what, what the coin can also do. Yeah, that's really cool that you were you guys were one of the first people to, to do staking. Um, speaking of competition so are there any other bitcoin forks that are in the top 100 coins that have uh you know billion plus market caps are there any like are there any other dashes bitcoin caches out there yeah yeah um there's litecoin there is also in a way you could say ripple and stellar but they're not um individual facing they're more of like b2b and working with banks um i'm 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 not sure i haven't used it but i've heard that solana is also pretty fast um was it was that a fork of bitcoin too oh no 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 that's what i mean like what was you know i mean like yeah i'm kind of thinking like what were the other forks because it'd be kind of cool to maybe just like invest in a basket of all the forks of bitcoin that yeah yeah, that that kind of like, you know, increase the throughput or whatever. And so yeah. that you don't have to necessarily choose a winner and you can just sort of invest in all 10 and, yeah. you know, yeah. hopefully they all. I I believe Decred is also either a fork of Litecoin or a fork of Dash. But yeah, I'll have to look around. And, and the reality is, just like you're saying, I have seen that the market for payments coin has been kind of neglected in the past years. It has, and, it has. And I think it's going to come to fruition because right now there's, well, what I think MetaMask said that they had around 30 million users. So some of these people want to use directly the coins they have. And to be very honest, I love Ethereum, but it's not very usable for buying things unless you want to pay that, you know, 20 or, or $50 mm-hmm. gas. So mm-hmm. usage coins... I think are on the rise and, and there's a huge opportunity. I'll, I'll tell you an example. I read yesterday that the, the club in Miami called 11, they enabled mm-hmm. crypto spending about a year ago and they have received, I think, over $5 million in, in purchases in crypto. So, <laughs> so you that's know, a lot of bottles. That's a lot of bottles, yeah. <laughs> and, and what I imagine is that these are just the early shows of usage in developed markets. I haven't even spoken about what goes on in broken economies like Venezuela and so on. But, you know, people are starting to see, hey, this is not only for, you know, buying a picture of a monkey. This is something that I can also use for certain use cases. And and that's that's what we're doing. And like you're saying, I agree that maybe there could be a basket of, of potential um no, yeah. I wouldn't like to call utility them. coins, payment yeah. coins. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I I definitely agree with that. I think um, the coins that are in search of a market uh, are just they just don't have good fun- fundamentals. You know what I mean? And so a lot of people say that these payment based coins actually have the best fundamentals because they have 
widespread adoption. People already have them in their wallets. People, they have brand familiarity because people are like actually using them. Um, in the same sense that, you know, there's companies on the S and P 500 that's, that no one's heard of. And there's, because they're just sort of B2B. And then there's companies that people have heard of because it's McDonald's or Nike or whatever. And those are often, um, ultimately more valuable because they have sort of durable brand recognition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is, a, uh, it's a run for the long term. So yeah, it's, uh, let's see what, what the cycles do. And, and I mean, we, we have seen a lot of new entrants and, but make no mistake, our, our market cap has grown for the past years. So what's happened is that there's a lot of new kids on the block. If you know, if you may, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the Shiva Uno and the other coins and, and yeah, they, they can be interesting to some people for some time, but our bet and what I personally believe is that when you find usability in technology, that is what's sustainable. Definitely. So another good segue to talk about usability, um, feel free to take this in whatever direction you want to, to sort of speak up the usability of Dash. But I guess like, where did it all start, start organically? Did it more start in Venezuela, Latin America, or did it start in the U.S. first or kind of concurrently in different markets? Yeah, well, it, usability for crypto has to do in my, in my experience with two things. Number one, an ideological desire to use something different than fiat. And number two, a financial necessity of moving away from, from the local currency. So uh, since the very start of crypto, I know that there's places around the world, such as New Hampshire, where people are ideologically very, very open to trying out things that are not the government money. So mm-hmm. since the first time I heard about crypto, I heard that in New Hampshire, although I haven't been there yet, uh, there's a lot of places that are promoting and accepting crypto. But that stayed in, in my learning within a small niche within only certain geographies. On the other hand, you have broken economies like Argentina did a couple of years ago and it's going now, like Venezuela did, where just keeping your local money in the bank, you know, your bolivars or your Argentinian pesos is financial suicide. So if you, uh, I'll give you an example. If when I, when I left Venezuela to go to China, I sold my car for about 120,000 bolivars. Um, last time I went to uh, Venezuela, 120,000 bolivars would not get you a coffee. So a cup of coffee. <laughs> so if I had kept the money from my car in the bank, I would be left with maybe the tissue to, to accompany my coffee. So in a place like that, uh, people are forced to look for alternatives. And that's why in 2018, when somebody approached the DAO and said, hey, I want to do some stuff with Dash in Venezuela, they set up for a 50 people meetup and 300 people showed up. Because when you're forced into that position of not seeing your your money evaporate, people go and they look for many things. And that's the reason why the volumes of Bitcoin went through the roof for years and years in Venezuela. They're still very high, and and I'll tell you later why you don't see them now. But that just showed a different path to adoption that, you know, in 2018, the U.S., Europe, and many other places were not really, on a mainstream basis, open or interested in crypto. And in places like Argentina, Venezuela, Brazil, maybe, that they had a history of inflation or they were going through hyperinflation at the moment, they were like, yes, I need this. So... Uh, from 2018 till today, we have built a huge network of places to use things in Venezuela. And also consider that many of these places, because of the broken finance, financial structure, infrastructure, they, they don't have as many technological solutions like, you know, great APIs and connections. So 
regardless of that, we've built a network of places to use Dash in Venezuela, which include Church's Chicken, which to my knowledge was the first full chain of, of fast food that accepted crypto in the whole nation that was in Venezuela. And we have a couple of points of sale companies that then integrate into supermarkets. So we have, I think it's five or six full chain of supermarkets where you can go and spend Dash and Bitcoin and other cryptos in Venezuela. Uh, just a, a small example, when my mom goes to buy groceries, sometimes I, I pay for all the, of the shopping and she just writes to me a little bit before she goes to the, uh, to the cashier and she says, hey, Ernest, it's going to be $160. So I send the $160 in Dash, she gets it in a second, and then she goes to the cashier, they pull up the QR code and she pays, and that's it. So that is one way that we can make people's life easier in broken economies. Now, you fast forward to today and uh, in the U.S., and the crypto, uh, the, 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 the belief that crypto is real and is here to stay has grown astronomically from we don't need this mainstream to, yeah, this is cool. And that's why in the past six months, we have seen more and more non-crypto people being open to crypto in the US, such as this club that I mentioned. And I've read and I, we've, been, we've been talking to potential partners that are non-crypto that are saying, yes, let's integrate some of these coins and Dash is great. It's a perfect fit for payments. So I imagine or I visualize that a lot more of non-crypto companies are going to open up the doors for crypto. And the payments part is going to continue to be small, but every day bigger, because this is definitely the future. Mm -hmm. I, I really like the example that you used and definitely hit us with more anecdotes because it definitely and examples because it definitely helps paint the picture uh, to the listener. And what's cool about your example is is you had both a remittance transaction happening there, and then you also had a in country sort of peer to peer transaction happening there. Whereas before, think about what that used to look like. You would have had to send money to your mom to Western Union, she'd have to go wait in some line with 10 people in front of her at Western Union. Um, you know, there's like a 10% fee, so you're getting crushed on the exchange. And then she can go to the store. And obviously, we've removed that, that whole uh, inefficiency there. And so, um, and then they have basically the peer-to-peer -peer or, or B2C transaction uh, where she's actually paying for something in a store and the infrastructure is there for that. Because, you know, there's kind of a couple different pieces of the, the puzzle for crypto where there's remittances slash international transactions or intercurrency transactions. There's the store of value slash inflation hedge angle. And then there's also the sort of uh, in-country peer-to-peer transactions where things are sort of still marked to market in the same currency, uh, aka Bolivar to Bolivar. Um, and so your example had, had, had two going on. And then I'm sure you could also talk about how maybe you, you know, uh, give some dash to your family every month and then, and that stays, you know, probably significantly more stable, um, over time than, uh, than if they had held that in Bolivar. Um, do you have yeah, any other, but, like, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I wanted to, to stop you a second to say, to, to make it even more interesting, there is no Western Union in Venezuela. So if I wanted to send money, I would have to go through a circle of people that I know or that I meet on social media and that they become options to, to Western Union. And that happens the same way around the world in all the places that don't have good financial infrastructure. So, yeah, there, there's, there's many ways, like, for example, sometimes, and I gave the example of my mom because that's a very close one, but sometimes when you want to just send money to a loved one or you want to use local money in a place where you don't have an account, you just go peer to peer. And, you know, what, what, what I recommend people is, let's say that you're sending 
someone, uh, you know, $200 that they're going to use for the month, you can teach them how to receive in Tether, or you can keep it in Tether, and then you can change from the crypto to Tether, so that way they'll always have their 200 And then whenever it's time to use, you can change it back and send it, and they can mm -hmm. use it. Or mm -hmm. you can just, what I do in my case is I go to a peer-to-peer -peer exchange and I change that money for the local uh, currency. So that way, and, and what happens in inflation economies is that having money in your hands is like having a bit of water. You know, if you don't rush and use it, it's all going to drip down your hands. So you want to tell people, hey, Vance, when are you going to go shopping? And you'll say, oh, I'll go Saturday morning. So you'll try to send the money as close to Saturday as you can, so inflation will not will not hit you. And that is one use case, like you correctly mentioned. And another use case is, let's say you're a you're you're a good person and you live in Russia right now, because of all the blockades, you will not be able to receive a wire. So what cryptocurrencies would enable you is you can get paid in Dash or in Bitcoin Cash or in Bitcoin. And then figure out the way to sell that for your local currency. And then you would be able to go and spend it. And because you're not a sanctioned individual, you could do this without any problems. And most exchanges, even though there's a, a difficult time now for the good people that are in Russia, um, they will not block you. Of course, if you're uh, somebody working with the government, you will probably be blocked by an exchange. But... This is what I tell people all the time. Cryptocurrencies give you an option for having more financial freedom. And, and that is that is exactly the reason why, why I love what we're doing and, and we do it with passion. Definitely. Um, random question, but have you ever heard of someone buying a house or do it completing a real estate contraction? Yeah. Uh, transaction, sorry, in Dash? Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, back in, especially in 2018, uh, we had a couple of, of real estate companies that started accepting Dash in Venezuela. Uh, one of them was called Real Max, and I know that they were accepting crypto. I, I don't know exactly how many sales they did in, in crypto, but I know for a fact I spoke to a couple of people that sold houses and they got paid in crypto. Why? Because let's say that you're in Venezuela and, you know, you cannot just make a wire from Venezuelan Bolivars to whatever account and you don't want to keep, let's say you sell your house for $100,000 or maybe you, you sell it really cheap because you just want to migrate and you take $50,000. So yeah. you don't want me, you definitely don't want me to pay you the 50 k in Bolivars because if I pay them in, Boli in digital Bolivars, you're going to be losing money and it will be stuck inside the country. So your ideal payment method will be dollars. But if I give you the dollars in cash, you literally cannot take it out of the country. And for me to give you the dollars in digital dollars, you would have to have an account in the U.S. And maybe that's not the case for most people. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, if you receive crypto, that's a perfect solution because you will always have it in a digital form and then you can move that money however you prefer, whether that's, you know, putting 10,000 of those 50,000 into a friend's bank account in the U.S. That happens a lot in broken economies and then change some of that into uh, physical dollars and keep the other part for whenever you want to use it. So, yeah, I've definitely seen uh, more than a few transactions happening in crypto. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about, how, you know, when you buy and sell real estate, obviously there's one thing that's different about that compared to just buying a chicken sandwich at churches is that, you know, there's, there's real estate taxes and transfer taxes and, and notaries and stuff like that. And it sort of speaks to the larger macro trend that we're seeing around crypto versus the state. And, what have you seen in terms of, uh, I mean, at this point, I'm sure the Venezuelan government is well aware of crypto, um, uh, maybe not in their official, you know, communiques, but they're, they're definitely aware that people are sort of using it on the ground. Um, 
Like what, what is sort of the interaction with the state and the Venezuelan government with crypto and what are some of the nuances of, of, of something like that where, you know, you want to buy and sell a house, but there, there kind of should be like a, a tax. Yeah. Well, to, to many people's surprise, the Venezuelan government is very modern when it comes to crypto. They have uh, an agency that's called Sunacrip that's 100% dedicated to the cryptocurrency um, legal framework and an oversight in the country. So mm-hmm. there is an agency that deals with it. There is a tax law that was uh, appointed or that was created by some of the tax schools in the country. So, yeah, not only is the government of Venezuela now really aware that this is happening, they've worked to put on a legal framework that would allow them to oversee what's going on. So um, if you want to do crypto stuff in Venezuela, you have to get requirements and, and permissions to you know, run your exchange or anything. Um, so yeah, the government knows very well what they're doing. And this is besides their intention of launching their own cryptocurrency. I don't know if you remember the Petro, which was uh, 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 an intent of running a cryptocurrency. And, and then in my opinion, it didn't work for several factors. One of them is that uh, nobody outside of Venezuela wanted to take Petros. So that, <laughs> you know, it, that limited any type of liquidity building for them. Mm-hmm. And, but besides that experiment that they did inside of the country, they, they have many advancements that, that are surprising for people outside. Okay. Um, yeah, if you had any more thoughts on that, I, I do find that interesting, just sort of the anecdotal usage in Venezuela. Um, I don't know if you, by the way, I don't know if you, you saw that we did interview um, Ian Blass from Bitcoin Cash, Argentina, talking about how they're using Bitcoin Cash there. I know there's Bitcoin Cash in Venezuela as well. Um, so you're actually not, by the way, <laughs> mentioning this late in the in the conversation, but I, I have actually had a couple people on to talk about crypto um, on the podcast. I had Mark Falzone to talk about um, Bitcoin Cash adoption in St. Kitts and Nevis, as well as they're starting to see it in uh, the island of St. Martin and in Guadeloupe. Um, so just thought I'd mention that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so now um, I thought we would talk a little bit more about the adoption and usability. Um, okay, so just how the heck are there 160,000 uh, places in the U.S. accepting Dash? What's up with the, the partnership? Yeah, cool. So yeah, I mean, before before um, talking to you about Dash Direct, which is the answer to what you're saying, mm-hmm. I think that every action that is done to increase crypto adoption helps the whole industry. So I'm really happy to hear all these things you're telling me. I, I don't see other coins as being a competitor. At this stage that we are, where the, the crypto market is so small, every inch that we get away from fiat is an inch that we're giving to, to people to have more freedom. And, and then they'll learn and they'll say, oh, I like this or that coin. But that's, that's really great to see. And how do we get 160,000 places to accept Dash in the US? There's an app called Dash Direct. And Dash Direct is connected to tens or hundreds of different stores where you can, let's say, I wanted to go and buy okay. Applebee's. So yep. if I were at Applebee's, this would give me 6.5% discount. So mm-hmm. let's say I'm an Applebee's, and then I would go and when, when it's the time to pay, I would pay with Dash. So let's say that the dinner costed $89.57. Mm-hmm. I input it there, and when I press next, it tells me the discount level that I get, and I would pay instead of eighty nine seventy five, I would pay eighty three seventy five, and then what I do is I pay with Dash, and in the back end, it connects to my Dash wallet, but it doesn't give Dash to the Applebee store; it pays through the through a gift card network, so. Mm-hmm. 
when you are at the store, you say that you're going to pay with a, with a gift card, but in front of you, you're paying with Dash. So you're buying the exact amount of the money that you need to pay. So you don't need to buy a $100 gift card, for example, like you would do in other places. And it just deducts everything directly from your Dash wallet. It's a very beautiful and very uh, streamlined uh, operation. And, uh, you know, just like I'm showing you here, if I push that button that says purchase gift card, it takes me to my Dash wallet and you basically sign a transaction like you would in, in many other cases. And then it just deducts your $83 and then you pay and you're out of Apple Pay. It's really, really, really nice. Definitely makes sense. It actually kind of reminds me of um, on my Chase credit card. Like if you go, it, it's like uh, on the website, it's like you can get these sort of discounts for Applebee's and Bed Bath and & Beyond and whatever. And you just click it on the website. And then if you buy something in that store, it like applies the discount kind of retroactively. And it almost sort of looked like the same, a similar list of vendors. So I wonder if it's kind of like a similar uh, gift card network. Yeah, it could be. I'm, I'm not familiar with the, with the inside part of how it actually works. But what I really love and what is really interesting is that this would allow anyone in the U.S. in a non-custodial way to spend their Dash. And mm -hmm. to make things even better, they launched a debit card. So now not only can you oh, no buy in these places with a, with, a, with a card, but let me see. I saw it here. You can actually get a crypto debit card that needs no KYC. So... I mean, this is part of the of the power that I was mentioning to you of the DAO, where it's not only the protocol solution, awesome. there's also the other things that you can build around it. And this is one of the latest, uh, I will call it, go-to-market tools that have been developed under Dash. And it's really, really cool. All of my friends that are living in the U.S. love it. And they love that, you know, they can use their Dash at, hundreds of thousands of locations and now with the with the with, with the debit card they can use it literally at millions of places so it's it's really really cool to see the DAO and work and and uh, this is part of the uh i guess promo segment of the podcast but what is the so if i'm in the google play store like what am i downloading uh, or what am i searching to get this app dash direct here dash direct see. And so why would it not be showing up for me? Is it only in the U.S. or? It's only in the U.S. for now. Uh, okay. Do you have a Mexican account? Oh, no, wait. No, I think I am seeing it. Is this it? Mm -hmm. Is it made by CrayPay Inc.? Yep, yep. That's it. That's it. Okay, 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 okay. Cool. Yep, that's it. This is pretty new. Yeah, it is one of the newest things we have launched as a network. And, uh, oh yeah, I, I was going to show you, but I cannot show you because I have a Mexican account and uh, it, it doesn't show up for me, but it shows up for you because this is U.S. only. Yeah, I, I think my Google Play is set to the U.S. Google Play Store, uh, but I am in Mexico downloading yeah, yeah, off Wi-Fi. Yeah, if you set it up for uh, an American Google Play uh, mm -hmm. uh, options, it will show you. If if you're set up for non-US, it will not show you, and the reason is simple. There are no agreements to to enable these gift cards outside of the US for now. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. No, it makes sense. I mean, I'm downloading it right now. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And when you're in the U.S., use it. I mean, it, it's you're, you're going to love it. And the, the people that have introduced them to this, they just say that it's so easy and straightforward to use. And th there's two types of people that I've seen loving this. Number one, the, the crypto uh, fanatics. And they're like, cool, now I can finally spend my crypto directly. And number two, the people that want to save money. So those that want to save money... You know, you can go and buy a little bit of Dash right before doing your shopping and you can get, you know, between 6 to up to 13% at some things or maybe 9 I'm not sure of the of the higher part, but 
uh, at around 6% discounts and people love to get discounts. So uh, I think this is a very cool, unique and, and new feature that, that Dash enabled to, to the crypto world. Yeah, and I'll, I'll actually read a couple of reviews just because it's uh, sticking out to me from um, uh, in the Play Store. So it's saying, I booked a hotel for a family vacation, had a coupon for Hotels.com and saved almost $150 just by paying with this app. Pretty cool. Um, another uh, top uh, review, I live unbanked off crypto and I'm used to struggles of trying to use it in real life. Not anymore. Dash Direct makes it extremely easy, not only to find where I can spend it, but to actually go through the payment process, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is one of the first experiences that I can recommend to family and friends who aren't already into crypto because they'll find it easy enough to use to overcome the learning hurdle. So a couple cool reviews there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, try it out and then tell us what you think and, and uh you know, th this is still work in process. There are still many things that are uh, yet to be added there. So it's always cool to see this market evolve. Yeah. And if anyone's wondering, like, what's the whole point of just like doing it in Dash? Well, it looks like you're going to get discounts and, and pretty big ones at that and at major, major retailers. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. Yeah. Try it out. Awesome. Um, I had another question and it was kind of, a, it was about market cap. So sorry. I know market cap's not really like the best, mm -hmm. you know, metric for things like that. Um, but so adoption seems to be awesome uh, for Dash, 160,000 retailers, you know, tons of different countries and stuff like that. Um, but I, I'm sure people might be wondering this, so I might as well ask it. So at the time of this um, recording, Dash's uh, market cap is like 1.5 billion or so. Mm -hmm. It's like 75, 75th largest coin, something like that. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin Cash, sorry to keep bringing up Bitcoin Cash, but Bitcoin Cash is market cap is like 6.5 or 7 billion. Mm -hmm. um, and at least from what I see anecdotally, the adoption's quite a bit lower, although maybe a bit more uh, geographically distributed, like in Asia and the Caribbean and mm -hmm. stuff. What do you, like, who do you think's like winning the adoption battle? And like, wh why would, uh, Bitcoin Cash's market cap be like three or four X? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, l like I told you before, um, I know very much about Dash. I don't know a lot about the other coins. Um, but I have seen something that, whenever there's coins that fork off of Bitcoin, they tend to have a bigger market cap, even though some of them have, to my knowledge, not very much use. I'll just say Satoshi Vision Bitcoin, that has a higher market cap than Dash, and I have yet met one person that uses a uh, Bitcoin Satoshi version. So I, um, I would imagine that it has something to do with the tokenomics, and just how the word Bitcoin is in the name of the coin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but when you fork the coin, let's say you fork the coin at the 15 million coins mark, that takes for granted that you know. Let, let's do this exercise. You know, let's and and I don't know if Bitcoin SV has also 21 million coins, although I imagine it does. But let's say there's only going to be 21 million coins, and then you fork when there's 18 million coins that have already been issued. So mm -hmm. you have a fork with 18 million coins, but many of these coins are lost and are never claimed. So you have a low liquidity of coins with a very big distribution of coins that you're accounting for. So when you multiply the 18 million coins that should be in circulation for mm -hmm. today's price of the small amount of liquidity that you have out there, you can have very large uh, market cap without necessarily that being a reflection of all the market. Does that make sense? So yeah, I think that that is one of the reasons why some coins look like they're having a big market cap. 
And yeah, that is one of the easiest ways of measuring usage. And I agree that that is something that, that is tangible. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the other point is that I see that still a lot of the payments coin are the payments use case is not as big as it could be, although the industry is a couple trillion dollars. So what I imagine and, and, and what we're working on is we'll keep on building and we'll keep on getting more and more integrations. And eventually the usability is going to catch up to more value in the market. So um, all of the payments coin have been a little bit left behind for the NFTs and the, the newer protocols types of promises. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just a matter of time until more people start seeing usability for what it is and not only speculating on what the future developments will be for all of these newer markets. I believe it. I believe it. Uh, by the way, Ernesto, you're, you're excellent at setting me up for, for segues. So <laughs> what, what, um, so let's talk about what the future of Dash looks like. Um, what, what projects do you guys have on the horizon and what does the future hold? Yeah, well, um, definitely we're going to be integrating into more and more largest, uh, larger points of sale companies. We are, uh, personally, I am in conversations with about four or five very large non-crypto companies that are exploring how to use cryptos and they're taking Dash as one of their first options. So um, I, I envision that in the next year or two, we and I mean we, anyone around the world and, and in the Americas, will be able to pay with Dash at thousands or hundreds of thousands of places without it being so much a niche. So that is one growth segment that I'm seeing. And Dash is about to launch a new capability on the platform called Dash Evolution or Dash Platform that will allow you to, that will allow developers to write things on the blockchain. And what this will allow is that, let's say you open up your Dash wallet and you sign up as a Vans. And then when I'm going to pay you, I can look into my Dash wallet, Vans. And then it will just connect to you and say, Ernesto wants to pay you. So this will allow for more of a Venmo capability. And that is only the first stage. A second stage that we're seeing is, let's say you're a Pizza Hut and you want to pay with crypto. Then after they show you the bill, they'll tell you, hey, what's your name on the Dash wallet? And you'll tell them your name and you will get an incoming uh, message saying Pizza Hut wants to bill you for $38.5. So this is going to allow for more conversations between different parties through APIs. And another, a little bit more technical, but very cool capability is that programmers will be able to store data on the blockchain without having to use a single point. I don't know if you're aware or you remember this. A couple of days ago, uh, a very popular Ethereum wallet uh, stopped working for certain countries. The way this, or the reason of this is that the, uh, the, the Ethereum wallet is decentralized, but it connects to the blockchain through a centralized service. So if the centralized service gets a, a subpoena for the government and says, you cannot serve Mexico anymore, they can do it. What is happening with Dash is that this connection to record stuff on the blockchain is going to happen through the 5,000 masternodes that I mentioned, and that's going to be truly decentralized. So even if an organization came to you as a master owner and said, you cannot serve Mexico anymore, for example, you would block it. But then there's other five or 4,999 masternodes around the world that will not be blocking that transaction. So what we see is that this is going to open the door for more uh, decentralized use cases. And we know, I mean, you've been living in Mexico and Latin America for some time, we know that the decentralization of finance is something that can provide a lot of good. And uh, we, we still don't know what's going to be built on top of it, but I'm sure very excited to see what the future holds with this 
upgrade that's going to allow for efficiency, low cost, and fast transactions like we have now. But it's also going to allow some of the Ethereum capabilities that will enable uh, us to take Dash to the next level. And that's very exciting. That is very exciting. And so you living in Mexico, I mean, uh, I guess, could you speak a little bit to the um, adoption utilization in Mexico? Yeah, uh, Mexico is, is one of the countries with the highest uh, or, or the highest levels of development and fintech companies in the Americas. But because the banking system is really good, and I'm sure if you've been here and, and you've, you, you have a Mexican account, you have seen that the transfers are pretty fast and there's ATMs almost everywhere. So there's not a lot of people um, eager to use other financial systems. Uh, so there's a lot of development on, uh, there, there's a lot of um, organizations and unicorns and people building stuff, but there's not a lot of usage by everyday people. So this is one, one pending item that all of us that work in fintech still need to do for crypto in Mexico, because yes, there are a lot of fintechs and there are the Albo cards and there's a lot of neobanks that are popping up, but still not too much of crypto usage. And my interpretation is that, you know, there's not a big need, but we still have to find out, you know, some of so, so, some use cases and develop them before they're needed. Definitely. Interesting. All right, man. Well, we, we, we hit the hour and a half mark and I, I definitely want to be respectful of your time. Um, speaking of Mexico, I saw that you, uh, I was just Googling and I saw something about Talent Land 2022 in Guadalajara. Is this an event that you're going to be participating in? What's that yeah. about? I, I haven't spoken to the Talent Land guys this year, but uh, they're friends. And uh, since you're going to be in Guadalajara, I'll be more than happy to make an intro there so you can uh, get close by and, and, and check it out or maybe just participate in some forum. So I'll definitely make the intro to you. That's uh, that's probably the largest or one of the largest um, conferences that that speak about talent in Latin America. They're organized. I mean, they've been virtual for the past two years because of COVID. But when they were mm -hmm. not virtual, what happens is they usually gather at the Oh my God, I forgot the name of this place. But anyways, they, they gather at, at the Guadalajara Expo mm -hmm. and they usually gather for about four days and they're uh, divided in different areas. They have blockchain land, they have oh, wow. talent land, of course, they have gaming land, and you can just go and see all that's been built and, and what's been developed for Latin America. They have a huge part of, of hackers. So you also get... Um, I think it was somewhere around three to 5,000 uh, people camping and just coding all of the week to, to win hackathons. So it's a really unique and cool experience. I, I hope you can, you can make it. Uh, I'll definitely make an intro to, to the Talentland team to you and, and, and you know, just uh, figure out if, if you want to go. Or, or how yeah, that'd be cool. I, I think I saw it's in late July this year. Um, yeah. So that's awesome. Okay. And then, so we're going to have everyone download the Dash Direct app. Um, it's on Android. I, I imagine it's on iPhone as well. iOS. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Cool. I, Android and iOS Dash Direct. Um, yeah. I guess we're at the segment where you can sort of uh, promote and plug anything that you want related to, to Dash or uh, your other projects. Yeah, I mean, if people want to learn more about Dash, they can go in English to at DashPay on Twitter and Instagram. And if they want to check that out in Spanish, they can go at Dale con Dash. And if they want to chat with me, they can just uh, go to at Ernesto Contreras, which is my, my Instagram and Twitter name. And I'll be more than happy to continue the conversation and answer any comments or questions or just chat. So just let's keep the conversation going. Yeah, absolutely. And again, the, the Twitter handle is at DashPay, uh, D-A-S-H-P-A-Y. And then yours is Ernesto Contreras. Um, 
By the way, I noticed there was a, a famous Mexican like film director named uh, Ernesto Contrera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really bad for my for my SEO, right? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I funny a funny thing um, is that Contreras is a, a very very popular last name in some parts of Mexico. And uh, it, it's, it's not a, I mean, it, it's popular in a part of Venezuela and it's also mm-hmm. popular in the north of Mexico. So that was an interesting discovery. <laughs> yeah. And uh, by the way, we do talk a lot about residency and citizenship and stuff on this podcast, helping people sort of internationalize their lives. Uh, are you or would you become Mexican given the opportunity? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's something that I haven't done because I always postpone it. But I mean, given given the the issues with my own country, it, it's something I learned after living abroad is that uh, having two citizens uh, t- citizenships or two passports is mm-hmm. always beneficiary. So it's one of those projects that I've always said, oh, I should do it one day. I should do it one day. Uh, I don't know. Maybe this year or next, I will try. You must be more or less eligible or or, or very close because yeah. you've been in Mexico so long. Yeah, yeah. You're eligible in Mexico after, I think, two years of having your permanent residency. And I'm already way past that. So I just haven't done it because there's always something happening. Okay, cool. I know a a lawyer or two in in Playa that maybe I could introduce you to. (laughs) Cool. Let's do that. (laughs) Awesome, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for joining the My Latin Life podcast. Gracias por tu tiempo. Um, this has been a really educational episode. Uh, I definitely learned a lot and I'm sure the audience did as well. Oh, thank you for the invitation. And, and anytime you want to chat, uh, when you come back to Playa del Carmen, let me know and me and your Venezuelan friend, will will take you out for arepas and drinks and we'll definitely stay in touch, man. Awesome. Thanks again, bro. All right. Take care. <laughs>